Before you perish, know that your death will not be meaningless. The Lord of Skulls shall feast on your heart and drink of your blood, woman. And know that in the times of darkness that will soon come to engulf the world, the gods themselves will walk the land, leading their legions in the battle to end all battles. And in those end times, Great Carneth will cut down your lady, hacking her head from her shoulders, and great shall be the lamentation. Your goddess shall perish. She knows this, and now you too know the truth. From Hyarl Egil Sturbjorn to a dying priestess of the Lady of the Lake. Egil Sturbjörn of the Scalings, also known as the Slayer of Souls and the Butcher of Immortals, was a Norsken High Jarl and one of the greatest champions of the blood god Korn to ever walk the land. The Chaos Lord attained leadership of his clan by defeating his own father in single combat, hacking his head from his shoulders and thus ensuring his passage to the Blood God's Halls of Bustle. As a result, the ancient hell-forged axes, Gumr and Gorm, became his to wheel on the battlefield. Holy artifact of his forefathers, they had been passed down the line of High Jarls for generations. Under his leadership, the scalings of Strovengard attained many glorious and bloody victories in their countless raids and battles against their rivals. The neighboring Norse tribes, such as the mighty Graylings and Wargs, the countless Kurgan horse clans, and even the slant eyed hung barbarians to the far east. Along the way, Sturbjorn had, as many warlords of Norska, made an alliance with the Chaos Dwarves, specifically with the Dwarf Lord Zumara, in order to avail their craft, particularly the mighty hell cannon of Ereshkigal Namtar so named for the twin demons of blood, fire, and industry bound in its creation. While Sturbjorn was wary of the excessive greed of the Dark Dwarves, the power of the demon construct proved great enough for him to tolerate the presence of the Dwarves, paying them their guild of slaves and gold without rancor after every victory brought with the fury of the powerful Hell Cannon. He had become particularly impressed with the weapon's might during his war with the rival Esgar clan, as its power had reduced their mighty fortress to a flaming ruin within moments. High Jarl of the Scalings Sturbjörn had taken many consorts from amongst the women folk of Strovengard, for many women of Norska are desirous to share their beds with warriors who bear the stigmata of the Dark Gods. From these countless wives did Sturbjörn sire a brood of thirteen progeny of all ages, Amongst them were Hrefna and Freigard, sword maidens of consummate skill and deadliness. Yet no one amongst his wives could give to him a son, a true warrior who could carry on the name of the warlord after his death. The hoary bearded champion was troubled by this and long awaited a sign from the Dark Gods to reveal the woman who would be blessed with the honor to carry his true heir. It was under Sturbjorn's reign that a Bretonian was inducted into the tribe 
and this was no slave taken upon a raid, but a male child adopted and set under the guidance of the tribe's shaman. A boy who had drifted across the northern seas on a rickety fishing coracle half dead, but with a defiant glare in his eyes, born from hate and desperation. Sturbjorn's god-touched eyes saw the power radiating from the boy and perceived the mark of the dark gods upon him, for he had the ability to tap into the powers of chaos and command the winds of magic, what the Bretonians ignorantly knew and feared as Fey touched Thus did Sturbjorn see the favor of his gods in taking this child as his own, and taught the child the ways of the scalings, the ways of war, how to honor the gods with one's actions, and how to live and die with the honor befitting a man of Norska, and named him Bjarki, or Little Bear. Sturbjorn had slain tens of thousands of foes in battle, and had amply demonstrated the favor of his god Korn by doing so. Among some of his greatest achievements was to duel a mighty dragon ogre Shagoth atop the high knife peaks of Norska, amidst a mighty storm conjured by the dark gods that woke the beast defeating the prime evil horror in single combat and carving its very heart out from its chest. He alone faced a great serpent of the undersea, spearing it through its belly and dragging it ashore before cutting its head from its neck. He took leave of his clan for a time to wander the darkened roads of the Chaos Wastes and smite the numberless monstrosities there to further show his power. He had ran with the terrible Ulfarana, hunted alongside the hulking, white-furred beastmen of Nuska, the Yimgir, and had feasted at the tables of the terrible blood beasts of Korn. This and more, Egil Sturbjörn, wielder of the legendary demon axes Garm and Gorm had done. For the bloodthirsty Chaos Warlord was truly the beloved of his grim god, and Korn had lavished his favored champion with blessing upon blessing. Clad in black, impenetrable chaos plate forged in the likeness of wolves, his long blonde beard and hair streaked with iron, a sign of an elder warmaster who had been the doom of thousands of foes. His pale eyes blazed with the fiery rage of corn, and his ornate chaos plate was festooned with trophies of his brutal and bloody victories. He stood as a true avatar of his god's power, and it was clear to many that he was long ahead on the path to ultimate glory and demonhood in his own right. Only a foolish hunter returns to the same hunting ground every day. A wise hunter varies his hunts so as to not hunt any of his prey flocks to extinction. From Jarl Egil Sturbjorn. Sturbjorn made preparations for a massive invasion of the far southern kingdom of Bretonia, realm of the horsemen when his seer, the shaman Bjarki, received a blood vision from the dark gods of the woman destined to bear Sturbjorn's demonic son. The realm of chivalry had for far too long gone unmolested by Sturbjorn and his raiders, and the mighty warlord knew at once that the gods had answered his prayers. 
Determined to at last ensure his legacy, he did bid his legions of battle-hardened tribesmen to take to their dragon ships that they might make war upon the horsemen once again. Sturbjorn's longships initially made landfall on the great island of Lundry, off the coast of Lyoness, located in the far northwest of the country. Though there were literally thousands of inlets that made up the archipelago of the northwestern coast, Lundry was by far the most significant of these barren isles able to support a relatively large and modestly prosperous population. It was also reputed to have been protected by the Lady of the Lake, though this was soon proved an erroneous assertion, and though it was true that the people of Lundry had often paid homage to the god Manan, offering sacrifices unto him that he might guard the seas from the fury of the Chaos Raiders, Whatever supplications they had made to that god proved insufficient to protect them from Sturbjörn's brutal invasion. The Norskans had made landfall upon the isle with the coming of winter, and despite the seas having roiled and heaved with fury, their fleet had emerged unscathed by the grace of the Dark Gods. Sturbjörn's legions, composed of bloodthirsty axemen, feral Ulfrenar, and mighty Huskals, bedecked in hulking plate, fell upon the meager defenders of Lundry and slaked their thirst for death with the blood of the innocent. Sturbjörn himself made short work of all those who dared his wrath, slaying both mere militiamen and priestesses alike with terrible ease. His raiders had closed in on the isle from both sides, thus blocking off all routes of escape from their rage. Those who could not fight thus clamoured their way to take refuge in the only place left that could afford protection, the Holy Abbey of the Lady, for which the Isle was so famed. Though he had raided the Bretonian coastlines many times, Sturbjörn had paid little attention to the faith of the men there. Having once hailed from the land himself, Bjarki explained the role of the lady, describing her as a petty deity of little true power, and her clergy as doddering women who were weak of both body and mind. Striding into the chapel, beholding a statue of the Bretonian's goddess, the warlord had felt all the more disgusted, here, in his mind, was a weak and degenerate god, not one of power and might like the gods of the north. The dying priestess who tended the chapel spoke of how the lady would defend her people and avenge the Norskans' desecration of her holy place. But Sturbjorn scoffed at this disingenuous statement and retorted to the dying priestess the Norskan prophecy of the End Times, where the dark gods who descend from their halls and lead the men of the North in the final conquest, and of how Korn, god of war and death, would strike down the weakling deity of Bretonia. In order to further demonstrate the weakness of the southern gods compared to those of the North, Sturbjörn personally destroyed the holy statue of the abbey depicting the weeping image of the Bretonian deity. As no divine retribution fell upon him, he had established the superiority of the northern gods. Those few amongst the people of Lundry who had fought to the last were given an honourable death by the axe and the sword in honour of Korn, Lord of Battles. Those far more numerous who had 
begged and bargained for life, were left impaled upon great brazen stakes to die by inches, their foul cowardice robbing them the dignity of honorable death. The blackened throne of Sturbjorn was taken out from his kingship and placed within the defiled chapel, his very presence so tinged with the demonic that it further despoiled that once holy place. The Norskans made sport of those few survivors of their raid and ransacked the wealthier homes for plunder. As the roiling of the sea had delayed the rest of his longships, Sturbjorn and his warriors thus stayed at Lundry, awaiting the rest of his mighty scalings to join him in despoiling the kingdom further inland. Amongst those forces were the mighty Tuskers, the hulking war mammoths of Norska. Though he had utmost faith, that his warriors would easily overcome any foe, he nonetheless wished to see the terror that would grip the horsemen upon bearing witness to those magnificent monstrosities. When the rest of his longships reached Lundry, he marshaled his forces further inland, intent on finding the woman prophesied to bear his promised son. The Ravaging of Leoness. We will slaughter them all and laugh as they beg for mercy. It will be a good day. From Jarl Ego regarding the battle with the Bretonians. Though the decision to wait at Lundry for the rest of his forces to gather rankled with some elements of his followers, particularly the Chaos Dwarves, Sturbjörn silenced all dissenters in his ranks easily enough. When the rest of his forces finally arrived after two days, the scalings made the push further inland. In particular, Sturbjörn was beginning to truly pursue his goal in the southern land. The seer had prophesied that the consort revealed to be a sorcerer's witch, was even now making way north to meet with him as the gods had decreed. They would meet on the eve of a great battle against the horsemen, where Sturbjorn would gain a great victory, and on the eve after, in sight of the demon moon Morslieb, they would conceive their child together. Concerned, that the mother of his son would come to peril alone, despite Bjerki's claims of her great power, he nonetheless charged him to take a pack of horsemen southwards to the Crow Fields, where the battle with the armies of the Bretonians was to take place, and bring her to him. Meanwhile, Sturbjorn turned to plot his victory over the armies of Leoness. No mere mindless berserker, Egil, the Elder Warmaster, embodied the bloody, tactical mastery of his Lord Korn, and he had plotted the downfall of his enemies since he got told the prophecy. He knew that the Bretonians would, given the reputations of the Norskans, underestimate their foes believing them limited only to a full frontal assault. Sturbjorn had sent a force of marauders ahead of the main horde to harry the Bretonian forces of Duke Adalar of Lyonnais, while the rest of his warriors moved inward, slaughtering and plundering supplies. Duke Adalar met Sturbjorn's vanguard, but only succeeded into fighting them to a standstill. Skirmishes with the Norskans continued after that initial engagement, with the Northmen attempting to gauge the full strength of the Bretonian defenders, and to hold them off while Bjarki and Kvedulf roved the western countryside, searching for the prophesied bride. 
dispatched by the king himself. The forces of Longui too marched for the defense of their southerly neighbors. Despite the lingering border dispute between the two dukedoms, Bjarki soon succeeded in finding the witch, Hectes, pale skinned and darkly beautiful. The sorceress had forcibly taken possession of a young Bretonian noblewoman, supplanting her soul so that she might be able to bear the Norskan's demon son. She was brought into the Scaling War Cam on the eve of the battle to come. Under the baleful gaze of Moore's Leap, though her eyes settled hungrily upon the Scaling Warlord, their coupling had been decreed by the guards themselves and was to take place under careful ritual with the lifeblood of Bretonians to baptize the product of their union. The next day, the first snows of winter had come early, unnaturally so, some had thought. The Battle of the Four Armies The Scalings had assembled into a wide advance, with a strong center comprised of the mighty, heavily armored Huskars. As a predominantly infantry army, given the Norskans' general mistrust for horses in the thick of battle, it was thought that the Scalings would position themselves atop an elevated position, such as the Great Mott just behind their position. But instead, they had marched forward to engage the Bretonians in open battle. The field was seemingly poorly chosen, a wide, flat plain with little in the way of hills, rocks, or trees to obstruct the charge of heavy cavalry. Thus, it was a theater of war that favored the Bretonians' tactics. Duke Adalar had intended to launch a single, devastating heavy charge that would cut through into the center of the enemy horde, where Sturbjorn was thought to have dwelled, thus routing the Norskan invasion. The Pegasus Knights, however, could not deploy along with the rest of the army due to the inclement weather. It was a simple strategy on the part of Sturbjörn's adversary, Duke Adalar, but one that had nonetheless been exploited effectively by countless Bretonian generals. The army of the Duke march under the banner of Lyoness, the banner of Tyrulf, depicting the legendary hero and companion of the great king, Gilles le Breton standing victorious over a mountain of orc corpses, framed by a halo of holy light. It was said that the hair of an elven princess had been woven into the banner, and that any army that fought under the standard would never know defeat. Ten thousand heavily armored knights charged forth, with several hundred kept behind as a tactical reserve at the barbarian ranks. The Norskans unleashed their corrupted war hearts at the charging horsemen. The unbridled fury of the mutated beasts blunted the charge, slowing the Bretonian advance. The Norsemen too began to charge at their foes, though slowly, as though anticipating something, and overhead, a crimson light thundered into the sky. Here was the herald for the first phase of the scaling battle plan. 
for the thundering crimson fire was the signal to unleash the blazing fury of Ereshkikal Numtar, the Hell Cannon's arcane payload of demon fire smashed into the mass of knights, even as they themselves crashed through the Norsegan battle lines. Hundreds of knights were slain by the first barrage, burned and cooked alive in their own armor, flesh bursting into flame along with tabards, banners, and horse flesh, and blood boiling and bursting in veins, mingling with plate armor turned to quicksilver. The majority of knights who had survived the barrage stubbornly renewed their pursuit of the now retreating Norskans, despite the fact that it was very clear that the Norskans were attempting to draw the knights deeper into their midst. Only when they found themselves encircled by thousands of giant, black-armored chaos warriors did the knights realize that they had been duped into charging the foe's center, which had given away to them intentionally with little resistance. It had been a simple yet excellently crafted ploy on Sturbjorn's part, and it was now clear that few Bretonians would leave the field alive. The hammer had now fallen, and the savage fury of the Northmen saw thousands of knights and yeomen alike slaughtered and torn apart. Even with that, concealed marauders emerged violently out from under snow drifts, roaring bestial war cries as they leapt from their concealments and fell upon knights and peasants left out on the rapidly disintegrating army's edge. The shining army of Leoness had been brought to its knees. The defeat of the enemy was assured now, and the Bretonian ranks, gripped by fear, were already being torn asunder even further from within as elements of the army began to push for retreat. The inevitability of their deaths warring with their inherent pride. Nonetheless, Sturbjorn had one last malignant hand to play for his mighty war mammoths had taken to the field. Towering beasts with rage burning in their eyes, touched by the dark gods, they smashed the ranks of Bretonian and Norskans alike with earth-shattering force. A trio of the behemoths slaughtered hundreds of knights as Norsemen hurled axes and javelins from their howdahs, slaughtering hundreds. Sturbjorn himself sat in one of those howdahs, surveying the glorious carnage with delight. At the sight of the Norsemen's monstrosities, the remaining knights quit the field in panic. With victory in hand, the eve was devoted to the enactment of the ritual to conceive Sturbjorn's demon son. Eight of the tribe's mightiest were sacrificed for the ritual, having given their lives gladly for their master's service. Under the sight of Moore's Leap and the Dark Gods, in the presence of demons and spirits who had crossed forth from the realm of chaos to bear witness, it was thus clear to Sturbjorn that his son would be favored indeed. And so he took Hegtes under the sight of the Witch Moon, and a demon son was conceived. Hegtes herself had one hand to play, however, and after Sturbjorn had taken her, she offered him a goblet which he drained in a single draught. The cup itself held a dosage of World's Root, a deadly herb known to kill men in a wasting fashion. In large quantities, 
it could kill outright, and Hectes had laced the warlord's goblet with enough to kill one of the immense tuskers of Sturbjorn's horde. His god-given constitution allowed him to survive long enough for Bjarki to concoct an antidote, something the Kurgan had not foreseen. Hegtes had intended to birth the child alone, and then sacrifice it to the gods to attain immortality. Given how her decrepitude was beginning to consume the body she claimed to prolong her life all the more rapidly, Bjarki hurriedly brought his adoptive father back to health, and Sturbjorn awoke, burning with fury, incensed that the woman would be so brazen as to try to kill him, and worse, try to kill his son. The Kurgan had not gone far, and had not counted on the scaling shaman having the knowledge necessary to save the Chaos Lord, and had thus not managed to get far before Sturbjorn caught up with her. Shocked by his survival, the hag could barely summon her demons to aid her before his fist had sent her screaming to the ground in pain. Captured, she was taken back to the war camp, an arcane device of corn, a black cage edged with runes of the dark tongue and filled with blood was placed upon her head to arrest her magic. The Siege of Castle Leoness Having accomplished what he set out to do, Sturbjorn was ready to leave Bretonia, though the initial decision had rankled with some of his tribesmen and allies, particularly the Chaos Dwarf Zumara, who had yet to receive his payment of slaves from amongst the captured thralls of the raid. Zumara had gone so far as to threaten to take his guild from amongst Sturbjorn's own tribe, specifically singling out his daughters. But the Chaos Lord made light of that threat, reciting an old proverb about the fury of scaling women, and would not be deterred. Any challenge to his decisions he quelled with violence, Realizing the birth of the scaling demon child would herald great devastation for Britonia when father and son returned to her shores, Morgana le Fay, Fay enchantress and leader of the cult of the lady, charged one of her disciples, Anara, to prevent this from coming to pass. To this disciple, she afforded the aid and protection of the Grail Knight, Reolus, a warrior reckoned by many within Britonia and beyond to be amongst the most elite swordsmen of the old world. The two traveled to Castle Leoness, where Adala's army had fled. Joined by a contingent of knights, the Bretonians crept into the scaling camp under the cloak of sorcery, while Sturbjorn and his warriors rejoiced and celebrated their great victory in the lands of the horsemen, the tribe's skulls regaling them with the saga of the berserker Knut the Bloody. The Bretonians succeeded in capturing Hagtess along with the unborn child. When he realized this, Sturbjorn flew into an apocalyptic rage, his god touched bellow, carrying easily through the winding halls of the fallen temple of Lundry, rallying the Norsemen to battle. Eyes ablaze with a fire of corn, Sturbjorn vented his anger upon the assailants, hacking men from crown to sternum as he frantically attempted to prevent the Bretonians from fleeing. Ultimately, however, the warlord's prize was stolen away from him. 
burning with fury, the scaling Chaos Lord swore that he would slaughter every last man, woman, and child of Britonia in order to save his son. Norsken longships began sailing from their rallying point on the Isle of Lundry, making beachhead upon Leoness's shore once again. The sight of the dreaded sails of the scalings, combined with the utter terror the devastating defeat suffered by the Duke's army caused, led to the peasantry almost rioting in fear, frantically attempting to book passage to the island stronghold of the Count. The Norskans sacked the townships of the Leoness mainland, plundering the settlements for supplies with which to carry out their coming siege, creating siege ladders, battering rams, and makeshift catapults. A barrier was formed around the island, created by lashing hundreds of longships together, while all the while, hundreds more made beachhead, unloading their cargo of bloodthirsty warriors and feral chaos beasts. The First Assault When the last thousand made it to shore, the vast horde of her Jarl Egil Sturbjörn had finally gathered and the champion of Korn led them in a blood-curdling war cry. The Norskans began the siege by building a defensive emplacement far out of range of the Bretonian trebuchets, for the mighty Hell Cannon that had been instrumental in their prior victory. Its power would now be all the more necessary for the coming siege, the first offences were to probe and weaken the defences of the Great Citadel, the opening wave consisting of blood-maddened berserkers. Though the thousand-strong wave was utterly defeated, they had inflicted grievous casualties upon the defenders. Nineteen knights and two hundred peasant levies, Though Castle Leoness had stood unconquered for nigh 1,500 years, no man was quick to forget the bloody defeat they had suffered at Sturbjörn's hands, and some began to whisper it was better to simply give the barbarian king that which he sought. Regardless, the battle looked set to continue. The fury of Eresh Kigal Namtar was once more unleashed. The demonic fire of the Hell Cannon lanced into the battlements of the castle, reducing the topmost towards to molten rock, sending flaming debris in all directions and killing hundreds of men at arms. The next barrage was just as devastating, and though Castle Leoness had stood undaunted against the hail of cannon fire of the Empire's war machines, not even its ancient stone could withstand the power of raging demons and dwarf craft. Realizing that the siege would end in defeat unless the enemy's artillery was neutralized. The Grail Knight Reolus led a sortie forth to destroy the cannon, which he succeeded at, banishing the demons too that had been bound to the cannon's iron and steel. Nonetheless, this was but a mere setback to the grizzled Sturbjorn, for though the Hell Cannon was no more, the Bretonians had revealed a damning truth when their priestess parted the seas that their champion might lead his sortie. The waters of the strait were naught but thirty feet deep. As masters of the sea, this knowledge would prove devastating in the hands of the Norsemen. 
The Norsken offensive soon restarted, and with even greater lethality. The next wave was filled with heavily armored, blood-crazed chaos warriors and grizzled veterans eager for the chance to die honorably in battle. The warriors smashed into the defenders on the battlements, reaping a hefty toll from the Bretonian knights. While they were driven back, yet another wave was all too ready to attack, affording the Bretonians no breathing room for which to recover. The defenders were thus forced to quickly shore up their defenses, in spite of mounting casualties and weariness. Regardless, the true blow of Sir Bjorn was not martial on the walls, but rather in assigning a special task to Bjarki and a cadre of warriors. Having questioned prisoners of war, the Norskans uncovered the existence of a secret route into the castle. Bjarki and his warriors made their way to the mechanism that operated the castle portcouli, slaughtering their way through the opposition they encountered on the way. A score of Swainbjorn's dragon ships arrived, sailing the shallow strait and through the portcouli, each ship with a hole filled to bursting with bloodthirsty berserkers too long denied the glory of slaughtering their foes in the name of corn, And with the arrival of these warriors came the sounds of deafening trumpets, heralding the coming of the great war mammoths that had wrought such havoc on the battlefield amongst the knights of Lyoness just three weeks prior. Stomping their way across the shallow strait, carrying yet more warriors in their howdahs, the mammoths would allow the invaders to bypass the walls entirely. Like living butter rams, they hammered open the mighty gates of the castle, allowing the elite of the Norsken army, Sturbjörn's mighty Huskals, each a powerful champion of chaos in his own right, Massive, giants encased in unholy armor, festooned with bloody trophies and fetishes, declaring their brutal piety to charge into battle. With contemptuous ease did these warrior kings slaughter everything that stood before them, hacking through armor, flesh, and bone. However, the Huskals eventually met their match in the Grail Knight, Reolus. Many attempted to earn further glory by slaying the living saint, and all failed. With massive battle axes in hand, Sturbjorn slaughtered his foes in their scores, a bloody god of war astride the battlefield, his twin axes wailing and screaming as they hacked off limbs and heads from bodies with every swing. With every life he took, the warlord roared and bellowed, laughed and sang, reveling in the screams of the dying. The gaze ears of blood streaming from the severed necks and the pleasing sound of shattering bones as he crushed their skulls and tore asunder their bodies under his axe blades. The Norskans assault forced the remainder of Bretonian army to retreat to the inner keep. From then on, the Norskans started to besiege that building. In the surrounding area, the Norskans had desecrated the sacred temple of Manan that stood on the outskirts of the island, slaughtering the knights who protected the holy place, before murdering the venerable priests and tearing down the statue of Manan in honor of their blasphemous gods, eliciting cries of outrage and sacrilege from the defenders on the battlements of the keep. Sturbjorn ordered wave after wave of men at the keep, uncaring of the mounting casualties as victory lay so close. 
Thousands of scalings were slain within minutes. So great was the scale of bloodshed. But it made no difference, for the Norskans were winning, swiftly and surely. It was thus, Egil Sturbjörn, a raging warlord of the Norse, an exalted champion of the Blood God, whose puissance and tactical acumen had allowed him to take the legendary castle of Lyoness, where all others before him had failed, and at such an unfathomably quick speed as well. It staggered the nobles of Lyoness that it was a savage raider of the northern seas that had finally brought them so low. As the Norsemen began to hammer the gates apart, a wailing cry pierced the air, the birth screams of the demon child that was Sturbjörn's blood son. An excruciating sound that echoed not only in the mortal realm, but also in the madness of the realm of chaos, existing in both simultaneously. Those too attuned to the winds of magic fell to their knees in agony upon hearing the cry, and even those not gifted with the powers of magic felt their souls tremble before the scream of this unnatural birth. Only the father, Sturbjorn, was not unmanned by the sound, but rather beamed with pride and joy that the gods had at last answered his prayers. The Challenge I am Egil Sturbjorn, High Jarl of the Scalings, Slayer of Souls, and Butcher of Immortals. Hear my words, the blood of ten thousand slaughtered enemies stains my blades. I have bested the nameless horrors of the northern race, and have walked free to speak the tale. Alone, I spared a great worm of the underseas, battling it for a day and night before dragging it ashore and cutting its head from its neck. I have walked the smoking paths of the night shades and have emerged unharmed. I have strangled ice trolls with my bare hands. I have run with the Ulfarana, hunted with the Imgir, and feasted with the blood beast. I have stood upon the knife peaks as the gods threw jagged bolts of lightning down upon me and defeated one of the great dragon kin wakened by the storm, cutting it still beating hard from its chest. This and more have I done. I, Egil Sturbjörn of the Scalings, never have I asked for quarter from an enemy, and never have I offered it until now. Though Sturbjörn's advisers had protested his decision to parley with the Bretonians, he had remained adamant in his decision to throw down the gauntlet before them, challenging their greatest warrior to a duel in order to decide the fate of the seed. He would not leave the life of his beloved son to chance, for who was to say that the Bretonians would not smother him to death as the keep fell, or throw him from the battlements out of spite? It was, after all, what he would do in their position. Sturbjorn thus offered his terms. The greatest warrior amongst the Bretonians would come forth to face him in battle. If he prevailed, the horsemen would bring out his son. If he failed, then he would be dead. In either case, he pledged the Scalings would grant the Bretonians mercy and return to their homeland. Sturbjorn's choice had brought some murmurs of bewilderment amongst the Scalings, for Many men had lost sword brothers in the battle to take the keep, and now that they were to offer the Bretonians mercy had elicited great disapproval from many. 
amongst the malcontents stepped forth the dwarf Zumara, who refused to spare the Bretonians as he was yet to receive his guild of slaves and gold for his services. He angrily accused Sturbjorn of being a coward and an oathbreaker, which in turn angered the prideful Norsken king greatly, and the two fought. While Sturbjorn was a true paragon of warfare, Zumara was an ancient dwarf lord who had forged his strength and skill across countless centuries, and so were evenly matched. And Sorcelled Obsidian clashed with Hellforged Steel as the two warriors matched their titanic strength. Though the High King was easily twice the height of the Chaos Dwarf, he was implacable as a mountain and weathered each of the warlords' crushing blows with iron resolve. The two warriors traded a dozen blows in barely the space of a single heartbeat. Such was the fury of their battle. Sturbion struck his mighty armored fist into the dwarf's broad face several times, each blow strong enough to shatter stone. But still, the dwarf would not fall. Zumara hammered his great axe into the Norsken side. But this, likewise, did not faze Sturbjorn, who held Zumara in place and rained many unforgiving blows down upon him. The Dwarf Lord threw the scaling Jarl onto the ground and charged forth, screaming to deliver his killing blow. Grasping the haft of one of his demon axes, Sturbjorn threw the mighty blade at the loping dwarf, striking him square between the eyes and killing him instantly. The king's god-touched flesh quickly knit itself back together, and he retrieved his holy weapon from the chaos dwarf's skull, roaring a challenge for any other who sought to dispute his rule. No man stepped forward. Sturbjorn shouted again at the battlements, Bjarki serving as his translator, demanding that the Grail Knight, Reolus, whom he had briefly met during the melee in the castle courtyard, come forward. For the High Jarl judged the Paladin as being able to provide him an adequate challenge. Realizing the battle was all but lost, Duke Adalar agreed to these terms, asking for an hour's time to make the arrangements. The Duel Egil Sturbjorn stepped forward from the endless ranks of his bloodthirsty countrymen, his weathered, bearded face ritualistically painted a demonic red in honor of his god under his massive, horned battle helm. His stride was that of a man supremely confident in his ability, of a man who had slaughtered whole races single-handed, and who had trod entire nations underfoot. Halfway before the keep, he bellowed his challenge, his voice reverberating with unholy power. To oppose him stepped forth the Holy Knight, Reolus, legendary Grail Knight of Britonia, whose very eyes burned with fey light. In his hand, the anointed warrior held the mighty blade, Durandial, which sang with holy might. The two gods of war faced each other, but separated but a mere twenty paces. What happened next was a glorious battle, one that would live long in the songs and legends of Bretonia, regardless of the outcome. The revered Grail Knight seemed calm and relaxed as he marched forward to meet Sturbjorn. 
His weapon was sheath, and he carried no shield. When Reolus was forty paces from his enemy, the Norskin unhooked one of the hand axes strapped to his thighs. The Grail Knight's holy blade, Durandial, was instantly in his hands. The movement so fast that the gathered onlookers had not even seen it drawn, and Reolus broke into a run towards the Norskin. The black armored warlord hurled the axe at his closing attacker, eliciting an angry murmur from the Bretonians. Duels were meant to be fought hand to hand, face to face. It was dishonorable and cowardly to utilize missile weapons on the field of battle, let alone in a formal challenge. The axe was hurled with incredible power, and it spun through the air, and over and, and towards Reolis' head. He swayed to the side as he increased the speed of his run, and the throwing axe hissed by him, missing him by scant inches. Less than twenty paces separated the two paragons of war, and the Norskin had his other throwing axe in his hand. He waited for the Grail Knight to draw closer, then hurled the missile at Reolus with even more power than the first. The Grail Knight swatted the axe aside with his sword and sprinted towards the Norskin, his blade clenched in both hands. Then the enemy warlord drew his twin demon axes and stalked forward to meet him head on. The two heroes clashed, Storbion's unmatched, brutal strength pitted against Reolus's sublime swordsmanship. The Bretonian's blade was a blur of silver that weaved a deadly pattern through the air as he ducked and spun in constant motion as he avoided the Norskan's brutal attacks. Though the Grail Knight soon succeeded in drawing first blood, this elicited no cheers from the Leonisseans, who merely watched the battle impassively. The spectacle of the two champions doing battle, both displaying skill and strength far beyond normal men, was breathtaking. With the most delicate of touches, Reolus ensured that blows that would have shorn his head, clear of his shoulders, and severed limbs were deflected, just missing their mark and leaving him unscathed. He deftly turned aside axe blows that, had they connected, would have hacked him in half, and his blindingly fast repulse sliced through the Norskan's armor, scoring several wounds within the first minutes of the duel splattering the snow underfoot with the Jarl's blood. The battle took a sudden and dramatic turn when Reolus finally bypassed Sturbjorn's defenses and impaled him with the length of his holy longsword before wrenching it into a disemboweling cut. Enraged, Sturbjorn gave Reolus a backhand blow that sent a Grail Knight sailing backwards in the air, sending him to crash upon the hard-packed ground. Arising from the terrible blow, Reolus turned his gaze upon his northern adversary and silently willed him to die. The Norskin was crouched on the ground in agony, blood flowing from his grisly wound, and his twin axes had dropped from limp fingers onto the ground. What happened next stole the breath of all who saw it. In defiance of Moore's rightful claim upon his soul, in defiance of his own mortality, in defiance of all sane and logical reason, the Chaos Lord dragged the great blade Durandial out of himself. The gifts of Korn had served him well, for whatever gruesome wound the blade had dealt quickly healed, leaving Sturbjorn no worse for wear. Yet, out of respect for the fighting prowess he had shown, Sturbjorn 
kicked the discarded blade Durandial back to its master and allowed Reolus to prepare himself for the next phase of their battle. The two warriors clashed once again in a furious contest of arms. Reolus stepped around his larger opponent, every movement in perfect balance, his glowing blade flashing back and forth to turn aside the Norskans' furious attacks. For long minutes, the two battled, each straining to land a killing blow. Yet they were so closely matched that few hits found their mark at all, and none of those were fatal. Soon, the Chaos Lord and Grail Knight were spent. Sturbjorn was struck with over a dozen wounds that wept blood, and parts of his Chaos Armor were hanging loosely. Reolus bled from a cut to his head, where he had suffered a glancing blow, and his armor was rent in two places. Still, neither warrior relented, and after no more than a few heartbeats rest, they closed the distance separating them, grunting with effort as their blades came together. The Norskan snarled and brought one axe crashing down in a powerful blow, intending to cut Reolus from crown to sternum. The Grail Knight whipped his sword around in a circular double-handed parry, and the axe blade slid down his sword to slam into the ice-hard ground. The Norskan's second axe wailed as it hammered around in a vicious arc, slicing towards Reolus's hip. Rolling his wrist deftly, Reolus continued the movement of his circular parry, and his blade flashed up, slicing cleanly through the Norskan's wrist, even as the axe screamed towards him. The Chaos Warlord's hand was completely severed, and it fell to the ground, axe still clutched in its grasp. The move had been so perfectly executed, so perfectly timed, that it took onlookers a moment to register what had just occurred. The barbarian bellowed in agony, blood pumping from the stump of his mutilated arm, but he still managed to clutch his other axe blade. With a roar, Egil Sturbjorn launched himself again at his foe, kneeing the knight in his sternum with sickening force, driving his breastplate inward and wrenching the once immaculate armor out of shape. In response, the Grail Knight swung at the scaling, his blade slashing a bloody gash across his enemy's withered face. Ducking beneath a hate-filled strike, Reolus then slashed his blade across the barbarian's thigh, slicing through armor, flesh, and iron-hard muscle before striking bone. Continuing his assault, the Holy Paladin tore his sword free and lashed out once more, impaling the bleeding stump of Egil's arm. Reolus's gleaming blade slid clear through the other side, becoming lodged. With a twist of his arm, Sturbjorn disarmed the Great Knight. Using his body's momentum, he brought his screaming demon axe, wailing in a murderous arc that hacked the Grail Knight's head from his shoulders, sending it flying through the air in a shower of blood. The men of Leoness let out a cry of utter shock and horror as their holy champion was felled, which was all but drawn out by the roars and adulation of the scaling hordes as they celebrated their lord and master's triumph. In turn, that sound was eclipsed as Sturbjorn raised the severed head of the Grail Knight to the heavens and roared his victory to the bloody throne of his god, Korn, who looked down upon his favored champion with great pleasure. For a moment, plain to all who beheld him, 
Sturbjorn's form was superimposed with the image of a towering black demon bathed in fire and blood with but a single hand gripping a familiar wolf-headed axe. An image of the glory that Korn had always intended for him. With a guttural roar, the Norseman demanded his son to be brought to him. The Aftermath I shall honor your dead champion and hold to my promise. I leave these shores, but I shall return. On that day, my son will stand at my side. Together, we shall lay waste to your lands. We shall kill every man, woman, and child that we find, and smash every last one of your stone forts to rubble. There shall be no quarter given. There shall be no bargaining for your lives. The Bretonians honored Reolus's pledge and delivered the demon son of Sturbjorn to his father. The child was strong, large for his age. The promise that one day he would match his father's strength and height clear to see. His eyes the same ice blue. There was little outward indication of the evil of his bloodline. Yet, nonetheless, the child's wailing screams died as he was set into his father's arms, and he looked upon the demonic face with delight. Sturbjorn beamed with pride, raising his son into the air and declaring him to his clan, who cheered at their future Jarl. His advisors were now ready to press the attack, to spill the blood of the Leonesians and garland the throne of Khorne with their skulls. But Sturbjorn refused, for he had defeated a mighty foe this day, a champion, the equal of any man or beast that he had ever fought, and sought to honor his memory by keeping to his word. But despite that, Sturbjorn left the Bretonians with a warning of his return, of the destruction he and his son would one day wreak. In response, a lone knight shouted his defiance. Sturbjorn turned to face this Bretonian noble. He had dark hair and wore a tabard of blue and red over his armor. A silver dragon was emblazoned on his chest, a symbol that the Chaos Lord regarded favorably. To the Norse, it represented power, martial strength, and passion. He saw that the warrior was young and bristled with hatred. That was an emotion Sturbjorn understood, and he knew that had the angry young knight been born of a scaling woman, he would have been blessed by great Karnath and become a mighty warrior indeed. Asking his shaman to translate the knight's words, he learned of his wrathful vow. The knight had promised that when the Norskin returned, he would be waiting. His return. I said that I would be waiting, and I am not a man who breaks his word. From Kalar of Garamond. Egil Sturbjorn would not return to Britonia until fifty years after the siege of Lyoness. His half-demon son was now a mighty warrior, perhaps greater than the Chaos Lord himself. The Jarl's heir had come to face his destiny in the form of Kalar of Garamond, the betrothed of his own mother, murdered after the ritual that spawned him. As destiny dictated, these two champions were to challenge each other on the field of battle, once again deciding the outcome of a war. Sturbjorn was confident, his son radiated with demonic power, 
His massive cleaver was wreathed in chaotic flame, and his eyes were filled with fury and destruction. The gods themselves were watching. Kalar, however, was no longer the young knight of the realm Sturbjorn had ired years before. As the Bretonian prayed, his eyes blazing with a fey light, the old Jarl realized that his patron goddess was also watching. The Grail Knight approached Sturbjorn's son, his own blade wreathed in a pale flame, and with thunder overhead, the two champions of the gods came together. And so ends Egil Sturbjorn's tale. Sadly, the end of it is forever lost to the annals of history. And now, onto his war gear. Sturbjorn is amongst the deadliest warriors in all the world, having defeated countless mighty foes, including a dragon ogre Shagath and, most recently, a favored Grail Knight of Bretonia. The Jarl's naturally prodigious strength is further augmented by an unnatural constitution, as the blessings of his god have made him capable of shrugging off even the most terrible of blows with ease. First on the list, Gorm and Gorm. The axes of the High Jarl are ancient, hell-forged weapons, heavy with infernal magics, their blades shaped in the likeness of wolf heads. A gleaming blood-red ruby is inset into the hearts, representing the eyes of the great wolves, and they blaze with inner fire. These gems burn with unholy power, as the axes taste the blood of his enemies, wailing and screaming with delight as they kill. Named in honor of the great wolves that accompany Karnath on his bloody hunts across the heavens, the axes were holy artifacts of the scalings, handed down through the generations. The mighty weapons are capable of splitting fully armored men in two from crown to sternum, and in Sturbion's hands can deliver truly mighty blows. And the Chaos Plate. Forged of blackened steel and adorned with grisly trophies and foul emblems, the Chaos Armor of Egil Sturbjorn is forged to bear the likeness of howling wolves. The very shoulder plates themselves are forged in the visage of snarling, tusked wolves which heightens the armor's ferocious appearance. All enclosing, the armor is spiked and segmented, particularly around the gauntlets, which lends great lethality to Sturbjorn's unharmed blows. And with that, we now have 500 newly enlightened souls, and so the mission to enlighten the world has come that much closer to being achieved thanks to you. Now, next up, the near-immortal, demonic Lord of Corn, known as Blood Wrath.